The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, let's get started. Settle down, settle down. The weekend has not quite started. Um, let's look at what happened on Wednesday. Uh, there's the scores. Class average uh, about 67. Uh, standard deviation about 17. So that, that means it's bell curve sitting right on the 50. Right on the 50. A lot of people improved. There were a lot of rags to riches stories. Um, but there are still a fair number of people down here. And so my, uh, my suggestion to you is that if you're, if you're down here and you want to, still too much talking, people. You want to start your weekend soon, I'll help you by inviting you to leave. You don't have to stay here if you don't want to. But if you do choose to stay, please sit in silence. This is 3091. So, um, if you're down here, get in and see us. Please talk to your recitation instructor. Uh, come on in and see me. We'll talk about strategies for studying, strategies for success. I want you to pass this class, but just doing the same thing over. You know, this is, I think, Einstein's definition of insanity, is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome. So if what you're doing up to now isn't working, let's try something else, and we can help you. Um, so the model solutions are up, and if there are changes that need to be made, please get in uh, to see me. Uh, why, why don't we agree not to do it until Monday? I'd like you to first talk to your recitation instructor and make sure that there's something worth uh, exploring. And, um, the final exam is on the 15th of December. The final exam is going to essentially represent the uh, equivalent of, of a double monthly test. You'll have three hours, but I give about double the amount of work. So it should give you enough time to finish. But the final exam will consist of a mix of what's covered since test three. So it's like a test four monthly, OK? and also some material going all the way back to the beginning of the semester. So it's both cumulative and focused. So it has breadth and depth, and it's really good to pass the final. It's really good to pass the final. You know, if, you're gonna, if, if, if people pass the final, it tilts things in favor of passing the class. If you crash and burn on the final, it raises a lot of questions as to whether you've been working all along, or you gave up and around uh, Veterans Day and so on. So uh, I urge you to keep at it. And you know, don't leave everything to the last minute. If you take a look at your final exam schedule, this is the third day of the final exam period. Some of you may have exams Monday and Tuesday. If you think you're going to cram it all in on a Tuesday night, it's not going to work. You're going to be very tired by the middle of that week. So you need to have a plan. You have to work incrementally so that things sink in. You can't just do high-speed fix second law and expect it's all just going to go zooming in. It won't. It'll look like first law. It'll go in this side, note the other side. Mm -hmm. So keep, keep at it. All right, well, let's get on with the, the lesson. Uh, today is going to be a chance to apply the org organic chemistry that we learned on Monday. I said we learned enough organic chemistry to set the stage for polymers, so today we're going to talk about polymers. Monday we'll come back and finish up polymers, and then that'll lead us into biochemistry. So this is all part of applied organic chemistry. To date, what are the types of solids that we've seen in 3091? We saw solids that are consisting of single atoms stacked. Then we saw compounds stacked. We, last day we started looking at chains, and we've even seen networks, some of them amorphous, some of them crystalline. Today what we're going to look at is a new form of solid where the building block is a long chain, long in quotation marks, and this is a polymer. Polymers are pervasive in our society. We see them in everything from your, your CDs, the CD cases, 
You see them in trash bags. You see them in clothing, microfiber. Some of these new fibers have uh, incredible mix of properties in terms of uh, comfort and uh, security. Um, auto parts all over the map. And when it comes to uh, soft matter, we as human beings, we are solid state devices. Mother Nature is a polymer chemist. Mother Nature is a polymer chemist. It's all macromolecular chemistry. So we want to uh, introduce polymers today. Let's have an operating definition. A polymer is a long chain molecule with a repeating chemical structure. With a repeating chemical structure. And let me give you an example. I'll give you one that uh, builds on something we saw the other day. We've seen um, uh, ethylene. We've seen ethylene or ethene. This is C2H4, and it has the chemical structure. Okay, what we can do, what we can do is turn this into a long chain molecule with a repeating chemical structure in the following manner. We can react it with something that will catalyze the destruction of this double bond. And once this double bond is broken, we can flip it over to the other side of the carbon, giving us the opportunity to continue to link. So this is done with uh, a, a radical. So we can denote the radical R, and I'm going to put this, remember, the unpaired electron. So this is a radical with its unpaired electron, which we term an initiator. And so this initiator, when it meets something with a double bond, reacts. The double bond is something that could be turned into two single bonds. So let's go to maximize bonds. So this one has no bond, broken. This one has a double bond. We could react the two and result in the following. Build this so that we have, and now this goes over to here. So now the initiator has attacked this double bond, built the bridge, and now the radical is at the end here. Well, Ethylene is a gas. If this is sitting in a reactor, gas molecules are colliding with this, so now we can attack another ethylene. And so on. You get the picture. Eventually this thing is thousands and thousands of, of atoms long. Let's do one more just for it. Now we'll have the, the bond here. One, two, three, four like so. And so now you see a repeat unit. Here's a repeat unit. And this repeat unit can go n times, where n is very, very large. n can be on the order of, oh, 10,000 or so, giving us molecules that have atomic masses of, oh, a million grams per mole. These are huge. These are huge. So we call this n I'm using N now in a new way. N is called the polymerization index. N is the polymerization index. And it represents the number of repeats of the mer unit. The mer is the repeat unit. And what's the length of this thing? Let's, let's get a sense of this. Uh, suppose we had something that was, so, say, 10,000 units long. So let's say N is 10,000. So that might give me all... Oh, something on the order of about a million grams per mole. Let me, do the, let me do the calculation a different way. Let me say, suppose I had something that had a, an atomic mass of 100,000. We'll choose a 100,000 grams per mole. This is the atomic mass of the polymer. And uh, divide that by the atomic mass of, uh, of ethylene. Ethylene is 28 grams per mole. So this is the mass of C2H4. And this is the mass of of the polyethylene one molecule. So that would give us then a polymerization index of 3,571, about 3,600. And if we estimate a carbon-carbon bond distance, about one and a half angstroms for carbon-carbon bond distance, that gives us something that's on the order of about a half a micron. A half a micron in length for one one molecule. And to give you a sense of what that really means, I want to show you a demo here. What I've got is a, a pull chain that you use in, um, 
oh, downstairs in Grandma's house to uh, turn on the lights. So this is a whole bunch of these brass balls that are held together by metal. And so let's have each of these represent carbon. And this one is about 3,000 units long. It's about 40 feet. 40 feet, so there's about 3,000 of these uh, units here. So let's get a sense of how, how big this is. So what I'll do is I'll... This is one molecule. This is one molecule. Okay. So imagine what happens when this, in the melt state, is flowing. What happens when the melt decreases in temperature and this attempts to solidify? What are the chances that this is going to come out in one of the 14 Bravais lattices? It's vanishingly small, isn't it? This is one molecule. I feel like I just came back from New Orleans. <laughs> I didn't even have to lift my shirt. I mean, look at all this stuff I got. <laughs> this is terrific. All right, so that's one molecule. And uh, if we imagine, if we imagine what happens, um, let's say that it's pretty clear that that solid, let's call this macromolecule. Solid macromolecules favor. Uh, favor being amorphous. Favor the amorphous state. This is the notion of pure crystallization is, is not... And we can imagine, for example, all of the rules that we learn for the inorganic glasses, the silicates, apply to organic glasses. So let's look at, say, volume versus temperature for something like polyethylene. So I'm just going to call this PE polyethylene for short. So we can imagine we're up here in the melt state, we cool down, we go through a normal uh, melting point and then we reach a solidification at some glass transition temperature. Well, let's say this is at a slow cooling rate, so this is TG slow and maybe another occasion we cool at a fast rate and so we will have a different glass transition temperature and it will be higher it will be higher. And let's say this over here at, uh, is room temperature. This is room temperature. So what do I find? I have two different volumes. You've seen this before. So if I have constant, uh, constant mass, constant, for constant mass, equal masses, the one with the higher volume has a lower density, right? So this one, this should be low density. This is, let's, let me just put the fast cooling rate. Fast cool, this is slow cool. So this will be low density polyethylene formed here, and this will be high density polyethylene simply by the different rates of uh, cooling. Constant mass means then that you have density is mass over volume, so the one with the higher volume gives us the lower mass. So we can see how by different processing, we have the ability to change between uh, high density and low density polyethylene as a function of the cooling rate. Now, other things can happen. If we go at a, at a low rate of cooling, we can get even down here at very, very uh, low cooling rates, we might even get some degree of crystallization. And Tom, could we switch over to the document camera feed, please? Well, let's see what happens when this thing attempts to crystallize. So here we are. So what can happen is if we cool at a slow enough rate, this can't form a single crystal, but what it can do is fold back on itself and thereby put these atoms into a regular uh, arrangement. So, so this is now forming a zone of crystallinity, a zone of crystallinity. And why is it doing this? It's doing this to maximize van der Waals bonding here. The tighter it packs, the, the greater the uh, intensity of bond formation. So we see this happening in the formation of such zones of, of crystallinity. And when this happens, we have a change in properties. 
we have a change in properties. Let's consider low density polyethylene. Well, we know that this thing is going to be mechanically flexible. It's going to be flexible. Because all we have, what are the only bonds operative here? They're just weak Van der Waals bonds. Mechanically flexible. It's high band gap material and it's amorphous. There are no grains, there's no grain boundaries, so it is transparent because of the high band gap and it's clear. We can see through it because there are no internal surfaces. So that's low density polyethylene. High density polyethylene, well it has some zones of this. So the high density polyethylene has these, has these near crystalline zones. Near crystalline zones and then it's broadly amorphous. The difference here is small. The density here is about 0.92 grams per centimeter cubed and this is about 0.96 grams per centimeter cubed. So there's a little bit of tighter packing here. But what happens when we get into these zones, these zones of, of regularity, because there's a higher atom density, this turns out to have a higher reactivity with light and therefore, I'm using N here not to mean index of polymerization, this is index of refraction. The index of refraction in the near crystalline zones is not equal to the index of refraction in the amorphous zones. So now we have zones that are near crystalline in zones that are amorphous and so we have the effect of internal interface and as a result the high density polyethylene is opaque. It's opaque. These zones here add rigidity add rigidity. There's, there's a stiffness here. So this one is rigid. So what do we have? We have low density polyethylene. This is what you see in use in food wrap. Food wrap. Whereas this is what you see in the, in the uh, milk jugs. The, trans the, uh, the milk jugs that are somewhat hardened and do not admit light. Both the same material, but what's happened is just a slight change in the, in the uh, strength of the material through a change in processing, change in the cooling rate. So let's look at how we can take this idea of tailoring properties and, and extend it more broadly and maybe put it on a firmer footing. So let's look at the various items in our toolbox. So we want to tailor the properties. First thing we can do is control composition. Control of composition. That's purity. So we can start with pure polymers and polymers that are made of combinations of different polymers. So let's start with the pure. The pure polymer, they have their own, because it comes from a different heritage, they have their own terminology. So pure polymers or polymers consisting of a single mer are called homopolymers. Called homopolymers consist of a single mer, one mer type, one mer type, and it's repeated. So, for example, polyethylene. Polyethylene. Ethylene is the repeat unit, and that's all you see. It's polyethylene from end to end. Um, then, if we want to mix different mers we get what is to a, a polymer what we would call an alloy in a metal system and this is called a copolymer a copolymer it has more than one type greater than one mer type greater than one mer type and so for example we could make a a copolymer of say polyethylene with say polyvinyl chloride polyethylene and polyvinyl chloride. In this notation, this lowercase c with the hyphens on e either side indicate that we're talking about a copolymer of these two units. So you know what the, you know what the parent unit is of ethylene. I've, I've shown you that. And we saw last day if we took ethylene, dropped the hydrogen, this became the vinyl radical, and then if we put a chlorine here, this is vinyl chloride. It's got a double bond here. We can use the same uh, 
polymerization technique, propagate this by converting it to a single bond, and now instead of vinyl chloride, we will have the polymer, polyvinyl chloride. And if we had both vinyl chloride in the reactor and ethylene in the reactor, we would be grabbing molecules of both types and attaching them. So as you move down the chain, you might have uh, ethylene unit, vinyl chloride unit, ethylene unit, and so on. And Tom, if we could go to the uh, a computer feed, I can show some examples of different ways in which we can uh, put these on the chain. So the first one, this is taken right from your reading, the first one is called the random copolymer, where A and B represent different mer units. So A could be ethylene and B could be vinyl chloride, and here they're just random. You get some unit of, of uh, vinyl chloride and then several units and so on. So that's, and some people want this for a particular mechanical properties. So let's uh, document these different types. So if we have a random arrangement, if we have random arrangement of the, of the mer groups, random arrangement of the mer types, random arrangement of mer types, we have what is called the random copolymer. So let's just use the same example. This could be polyethylene, lowercase r PVC. So that tells you it's a, it's a random copolymer. The next one shows uh, uh, what they're calling a regular copolymer where you have alternating. Alternating. So it's strict. It's strict alternating arrangement of mer types. So it moves from one to the other in alternating sequence. And this is known as the uh, alternating copolymer to distinguish it. You can't call it regular because R is already taken for the random copolymer. Uh, the third one is shown up here where we take and we, we cluster the different mer types. So instead of having alternating one to the other, we take a run of one type of mer and then a run of another type of mer. So we cluster, this is clustered arrangement of mer types into what we call, these clusters are called blocks, blocks of the same type of mer, and such a material is called a block copolymer, a block copolymer. And that's shown up here where you see uh, there's, what, four units of A, and then there's four units of B, and then two units of A, four units of B. This is a little bit unrealistic. Typically, commercial block copolymers are usually dye blocks or tri blocks. They'll usually have, if it were a dye block of polyethylene, it would be one run of polyethylene and one run of polyvinyl chloride, and that's it. You don't, you don't do this sort of thing, but the artist got carried away, and somebody didn't proofread, so, so there it is. And the last thing you can do is the one on the bottom, which is called the graft. The graft is sort of a, a type it's a type of a block copolymer where what you have is you have graft of one mer type in the form of a side chain onto uh, another mer type of backbone, another mer type for the backbone. So you cluster them, but you cluster them very deliberately in this manner, and that's shown in the, in the bottom one. So the backbone is all A's, and the side chain is all B's. And here's one, and some of you are going to be doing some traveling, so I've, I've put up a very common one. This is uh, ABS, uh, acrylonitrile butadiene styrene. So you've seen butadiene, we saw that last day, styrene. What, ha what, what this is, the, the backbone is all uh, butadiene, and then the side chains are alternately um, acrylonitrile and styrene. And this is what's used for hard-sided luggage and also this. All these old telephones are made of this uh, graft copolymer. And by playing with the, the nature of these side chains, we can obviously make this so that it's somewhat flexible or we can make it so that it's rather rigid. So again, examples of, of architecture at the, at the local level. Uh, dictating uh, properties. So, we have these uh, examples of how we can tailor the properties. The second thing is the configurations of the side groups. Side group configuration. These are all options that we have. 
and we exercise them in the synthesis by playing with the synthesis conditions and also the catalysts that are present. And that's shown here. There's basically three ways you can put the side groups on. So the, the upper one, the upper one shows the, the methyl group uh, randomly going. Sometimes it's above, sometimes it's below, and the, there seems to be no pattern. This whole uh, notion of side group configuration is referred to as tacticity. Tacticity. It means the placement of the side groups. So you see, I mean, there's only three choices here. Either you put them all on the same side of the chain, that's the bottom one, isotactic, or you put them on alternate. Once it's on one side of the chain, then it's on the other side of the chain. So you alternate back and forth with regularity. That's syndiotactic. And then the third case is, come what may, there's no, no uh, seeming uh, plan, and that's the A-tactic. So those are the, those are the uh, three types that you need to be aware of. Isotactic, syndiotactic, and atactic. And you can figure those out. Iso obviously means they're all on the same side of the chain. Atactic is as amoral, apolitical, so this is random. And then by elimination, this must be alternating. Alternating. And I think I've I think on the next one I did a little doodling for you, yeah. So here, just to bring home what's going on, the first one, uh, the top is atactic polypropylene. So you see uh, there's, the, there's propylene, and what, what's happened is this double bond has been broken, and now it can propagate, and this methyl group in some cases is above, in some cases below the chain. Here's uh, polystyrene. This is vinyl benzene or phenyl uh, ethene or styrene. And this double bond is broken, and you've got these uh, phenyl groups hanging off the side. And this is just vinyl chloride, which we saw over here. So, again, seeing how the, the synthesis. Okay, and then the last thing we can look at is, is the backbone, is backbone architecture or chain architecture. Chain here referring to the main chain. Chain architecture. And this uh, falls under the, the general term of conformality. Conformality. And we're going to revisit this when we talk about uh, proteins. It's very important in biological systems. And it, it, it's a direct result of this, which I showed you last day, that the, this bond is free to rotate. And if it rotates in certain uh, ways so that all of the uh, side groups line up perfectly, you end up with this so-called eclipsed version. So if you look at the chain on the very end, you'd see one dot that represents the backbone, or actually it's zigzagging, so you'd see the, the, the edge of the zigzag, and then all the dependent groups would be lined up in front of one another, and you'd see nothing except the very first one. That's the eclipsed, and that's the most regular, straight line, and this is staggered, where it, it, uh, it rotates where it wishes, and I showed you this one, where this is this is hardly something with a polymerization index of 3,600, but it starts giving you the sense of some are more nearly straight and some are very uh, heavily coiled. Both of these are still called straight chains. Both of these are still called straight chains, but there are some things that we can look at. So first, we have the linear one. The linear, the linear chain molecule and so that's one. All right. And furthermore, if you look here, there's some fine structure. You may even see that at some point along here, there's even uh, some attempt at uh, crystallization. But even so, the, the system moves in one direction from one end to another. The alternative is branched chain. Branched chain. It's a different type of architecture, and in that case, you actually have something that... So this is not graph. This is actually the, the main uh, component of the backbone continuing to grow, but growing in a plurality of paths. So you can imagine that one of these is going to pack much better than the other. One is going to have a greater chance of forming such zones of crystallinity, and clearly it's going to be the linear chain. These branches stick out, and they prevent tight packing. They prevent tight packing. So the branch chain is harder to crystallize. Harder to crystallize. And when it forms its amorphous uh, structures, it has more free volume. 
more free volume. And also you can think about the glass transition temperature, Tg, how is that going to work, and so on. So by looking at the, the branching, you end up with such structures. There's one other one, and that's shown here. And that's to take several chains, whether they're linear or branched. I'm just going to draw several straight chains here. And it's possible to link chains by joining them with some covalent bridges. Covalent bridges. This is a covalent bridge. This is a covalent bridge. And it actually links one chain to another. And imagine the mechanical properties of this material. The, otherwise, there would be weak van der Waals bonds, and if we apply a shear stress, we can cause the material to plastically deform. But these are strong covalent bonds. So what will happen is I can move this material, shear it up to a point, but then I encounter the resistance of these bonds, and as soon as I let go of the applied force, it springs back. So by cross-linking, by cross-linking, this is a cross-linked architecture, by cross-linking, I impart some uh, uh, elasticity, and this is, the, in fact, the structure of a rubber. And we call such polymers elastomers, elastomers, because they will, they will spring back to shape. And uh, what would have to happen here in order to allow for the cross links? We have to be able to form covalent bonds. If we're going to form covalent bonds, we have to break some bonds that are present in the backbone. So if I've got a, if I've got bonds such as this in the backbone, and then I come up with this R group that wants to somehow attach, it's pretty clear that if I break one of these bonds in order to make the attachment, I cut the chain. So by de it's axiomatic then, if I'm going to form cross links, I need to find a position along the backbone that has a double bond. And thereby, I can break the double bond convert it to a single bond, link up with the cross-linking bridge, and keep the integrity of the backbone while forming a new bond to an adjacent uh, chain. So this is, the, this is the condition for which we form elastomers. And uh, this is the basis for rubber. This is the basis for rubber. And I think this next cartoon shows that uh, here's, a, here's polyisoprene. And you can see there's a... Uh, double bond in the backbone, and by presenting sulfur, sulfur is capable, as is oxygen, of forming bridges. We saw in the silicates, in the borates, how the oxygen forms covalent bonds on either side, thereby linking silicate units. Well, sulfur is below oxygen. If we believe Mendeleev, it should have similar properties. And so sulfur is forming bridging structures, breaking these double bonds, and now linking the one orange backbone with the adjacent orange backbone. So sulfur enables cross-linking. And this, in fact, was discovered here in Boston. It was uh, Nathaniel um, Hawthorne who was working in Roxbury and was trying to stabilize rubber. Natural rubber is very sticky. And so he found that by adding sulfur, he could cause the, the rubber to lose its stickiness and thereby uh, develop a, a synthetic rubber that had superior properties. And then it was Charles Goodyear who came to Boston, saw this, took the invention, licensed it, and it was Goodyear who accidentally spilled some of um, this cross-linked rubber onto a hot stove, and the, uh, the thermal treatment gave a far superior rubber, which uh, gave birth to vulcanization, and then from there it's all history of... Uh, automobile tires and, and whatnot. So this is uh, advantageous from a property standpoint, but it's very disadvantageous from the standpoint of recycling. How could one possibly recycle this material? Let's compare these two. Let's compare the case of polyethylene. So polyethylene consists of many chains, and they will interpenetrate and entangle. What are the bonds between these chains? The bonds between these chains are van der Waals. This is a van der Waals solid. 
These are van der Waals bonds. And we know van der Waals bonds are operative at low temperatures, but not operative at high temperatures. So if we take polyethylene and heat it, these bonds will weaken, and this will turn liquid, and we can reprocess this. So by going to high temperature, we can reprocess. Because we're only breaking these weak van der Waals bonds. Now, if we take this cross-linked cross -linked, uh, polyisoprene, cross-linked polyisoprene, I'll show it in this manner, how are we going to reprocess this? If we, if we begin to heat this, we're going to have to go to an extremely high temperature because we have to break covalent bonds. Well, if we go to a temperature high enough to break these bonds, we go to a temperature high enough to break the backbone, we go to thermal destruction of the entire material. So such materials cannot be reprocessed by heating. So these are called thermoset. 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 And thermoset are very difficult to process, difficult to recycle. You might say, well, you don't have to just do it by, uh, by thermally reprocessing. Why don't you use some kind of a chemistry? Go in there with chemistry that will attack these bonds. These are strong covalent bonds. What kind of a solvent is going to be strong enough to uh, snip those bonds? It's going to be a very aggressive solvent. And uh, you know, what are the health effects of the use of that solvent? You want to bet the company on the use of that and find out later that uh, you've got class action lawsuits using such chemicals? So this is the issue when you, you drive down the highway and you see these mounds, these mountains of uh, spent automobile tires, how to recycle them. This is the issue. All right? Whereas over here, you heat this up and you can redo it. So such materials are called thermoplastic. Thermoplastic. They can be reprocessed or rendered plastic by uh, temperature rise. So they're environmentally much, much easier to process. Uh, a few more things here with the polyethylene. Uh, this shows what I was just doing on the, uh, on the projector, the, uh, the document camera, rather. This is the partially crystallized polyethylene, and this is what it looks like in these zones. You don't have all of the uh, chains lining up, but if you look at the atoms on end, you will see there's the C uh, C2H4 unit, and the C2H4 units are lined up. Okay? And sure enough, what is the basis uh, unit here? It looks orthorhombic, as you would expect. The molecule that has the aspect ratio of 2 to 1, you expect is going to come out in one of the uh, Bravais lattices that also has uh, some anisotropy associated with it. And here's some X-ray diffraction data. This is the diffraction of a fully crystalline polymer. So if we took a short-length polyethylene and cooled it very slowly or took it out of a solvent, we would end up with something that's totally crystalline, and we see we have discrete peaks. Here it's the same uh, material amorphous. And this, uh, if it's a little bit painful to look at this because it's reminiscent of a question on the recent uh, test, this is, what the, uh, this is what the data show. So by looking at this uh, mixed spectrum, you can get a measure of the extent of crystallization by looking at the relative intensity of the peaks versus this broad single peak, which is associated with the first nearest neighbors. Because in ethylene, we know that carbon has hydrogens as its nearest neighbors and, and so on. And so this works just as well as the, the f uh, free volume as a measure of the degree of uh, crystallization. So we see this. And the last thing I want to touch upon is uh, the uh, polymer synthesis, just to put that into uh, uh, formal setting. I've already shown you addition polymerization. Addition polymerization. And addition polymerization involves the use of a radical or catalyst, radical or catalyst assisted. And it's characterized by three stages where I showed you the initiation in which we generate the, the radical. Then there's the growth of the, of the uh, polymer until we get to the length of chain that we want. And then finally, the extinguishing of the reaction called 
termination. So what's really going on here is in the initiation stage, we create the radical. Here the growth is simply, uh, this is the polymerization. Polymerize, or if you like, attachment. And then over here is quench the radical, to quench the radical. And those are the stages that are involved. So all we're really looking at here is monomer attachment. Monomer attachment. And in this case, the composition of the polymer is equal to the composition of the mer unit. Composition of polymer is simply n is identical to the composition of the the mer unit. We simply use the radical to catalyze, and that's the only effect. But there's one other way to form, and this is called a, a condensation polymerization. Condensation polymerization. And that works a little bit differently. And it involves more than one mer type. So I'm going to show this as uh, mer type number one, which has associated with it a terminal hydrogen, and mer number two that has associated with it a terminal hydroxyl. And condensation polymerization works to attach the hydroxyl to the terminal hydrogen to form a covalent bond between the residual R1 and R2 and expels water vapor. These are reactions are conducted at temperatures above 100 degrees C, so this is expelled and ultimately is captured as a condensate. So oddly enough, condensation polymerization, which involves the, the, the stepwise building of the polymer by reaction between two different mer types and expulsion of uh, water vapor, others uh, condensate, is named not for what it is, but for the byproduct that is not part of it. So this is the prototypical reaction. And clearly here, you keep losing water. So in this case, the composition differs. The composition and the final mass of the of polymer is not equal to the composition of the mer groups. And the mass is, is less than less than the sum of the masses of all of the mer groups because we keep losing water. So I think here we've got some examples of the various materials. So these, this again is taken from your reading. Here's a, a, a suite of uh, addition polymers. Many of these you, you encounter in uh, everyday life. I've been talking about polyethylene. If we replace the hydrogens with fluorines, we get PTFE, which you know by the trade name Teflon, uh, polypropylene, uh, polystyrene, which you've seen in these uh, clamshells and, and uh, uh, not so much today in, in coffee cups for their insulating capability. Polyacrylonitrile is a fabric orlon. PVC is that white uh, uh, tubing that you see used in uh, plumbing facilities. Polymethyl methacrylate, many of you are wearing uh, eyeglasses that are uh, made of this material. This is uh, uh, plexiglass or uh, uh, lucite and so on. So, and then down here even some of the, some of the uh, rubbers. Uh, on the other hand, here are the condensation polymers and the, the, notably are the nylons. The nylons are made by condensation polymerization and I've put a little bit of fine structure on here. You can look at this at the website that the, the bond that will link the R1 to R2 is called the amide bond. This is the amide bond. And so the nylons uh, are known generically as polyamides. And uh, furthermore, there's one end that has the, <coughs> pardon me, the carboxylic acid end, and then the other end, which has uh, the amino end. And as you go down, you see Kevlar is here, which uh, you know is used as a substitute for steel. Uh, belting and tire is also used as the fiber and bulletproof vests. Um, some fabrics here, Dacron and Mylar, 
uh, various polyesters. The polycarbonates, this rigid uh, phenyl group here, is what gives the polycarbonates their high strength. This is Lexan, which is used in uh, jet engine windshields, and it's also used in um, sports goggles to give you the uh, resistance against impact and so on. So these are made by this uh, process, and we're going to see this process again when we talk about protein synthesis because uh, Mother Nature works by condensation polymerization. So uh, there are many similarities between the nylons and the, uh, and the proteins that uh, uh, make up our bodies. Okay, so what I'd like to do in the last five minutes is talk about an example of the use of black copolymers in uh, uh, energy and uh, some research that's been going on here at MIT for about oh, 10 years now looking at new materials to make superior batteries, batteries for the wireless age. And uh, this is, these are the kinds of uh, batteries that exist today in terms of uh, the amount of energy they store per charge. And you see lead acid, which is abundant and cheap, is actually quite uh, low in terms of how much energy it's, it stores. And what's in your cell phone and your laptop is the lithium-ion battery, which is 150 watt-hours per kilogram by this metric. And in fact, it was the advent of the nickel metal hydride battery that enabled the laptop computer. All of the components were in place in the 1980s. But sodium sulfur is a molten salt battery. It operates at 300 degrees C. So that was not very popular for laptop use. So the only thing that was available was down here in NICADs. And people were not going to release laptops that had a runtime of about one hour. But with the advent of nickel metal hydride, it all of a sudden became sensible to, to put out such uh, devices, and now we've gone to lithium ion. And ironically, as the capacity of the battery has risen, the appliances that go on the laptop have risen, and so the runtime doesn't change because each next generation has a more intense uh, power hog of a CPU. You want a DVD, you want a fancy screen, and so on, and all of that is consuming energy. But if you knew how to power it down and, and run it minimally, you'd find that you could get run times of... Uh, uh, six, seven hours. So the, the approach that we used here was to use black copolymers. And we used black copolymers such that we wanted to get a solid. You see, people think of batteries as these cylindrical devices that uh, are very heavy, but we had a different image. We thought that this should be the battery. Batteries should remind us of something like this. Okay. This is called dreaming. This is a potato chip bag. You think it's just nothing but a lowly potato chip bag. Open it up sometime. What do you find? You see, it's a multi-layer laminate of polymer and metal. Because a potato chip is precious, you know. You have to protect it against spoilage. So it can spoil by becoming soggy from humidity, or it can become rancid from oxidation. So we need the polymer to protect it from one, and the metal to protect it from the other. But this tells me that you can make a multi-layer thin film laminate very cheaply. Now, if this polymer could be made into a lithium ion conductor, we would have a solid state battery. Instead of aluminum, we put lithium. Instead of this polymer, we put something that could conduct lithium ions. And then we put the cathode on here. And now we have something that is solid state. It's very light. And it has a property that no other battery has. You can reshape it. Okay? You can wear it. You can put it in the body of a car. You could have it, you change the watch band to change the battery. See, you can think conceptually, you can do different things. So that's how it began. And with uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Ann Mays, who started a program to look at a class of materials, block copolymers, that were chosen in such a way to give lithium ion conduction at room temperature. Solids are very poor ionic conductors. Most solids that you know that conduct ions only operate at high temperatures. The oxygen sensor in your car doesn't work for about the first 15 minutes. When the car is cold, the oxygen sensor is getting garbage for a signal. It has to heat up. But we don't want a battery that runs at 300 degrees C. At least I don't. I'm... So there's selection rules here that went into play. And ultimately, we built something that looks like this, that has a methacrylate backbone and different side groups that could solvate lithium ions. And we made materials and ultimately uh, made first generation batteries that are thin film, mechanically flexible. And the choice of electrode materials provided its lithium-based chemistry and so on allow us to 
go forward. And it was by using the principles shown here on these boards that we were able to engineer a polymer that could have the mechanical properties of something like saran wrap, but have the electrical properties of sulfuric acid in your lead acid battery. That was the, that was the paradox. How to engineer those seemingly irreconcilable properties. Right there. Control of local structure. And so, you know, I've got all this stuff up here which we don't have time to go through, but let me show you where you can go when you get something that's really nice. Look at this. This is really, this is flexible solar cell. This is silicon on a polymer substrate. So it's collecting photons and converting them into electrons. And then you take something like this and you put it on the back of a flexible solar cell. And then you put on the front of this, you put the LEDs. So you put this up in the roof, you collect the photons, and then afterwards the, you get the photons back. Now that's change. That's change. Learn your chemistry. Have a nice weekend.